Well, I have a word from the Lord tonight. You can cut me down just a little bit if you want to. I have a word from the Lord tonight. You know, there's so many people right now in the kingdom of God that has so many questions. You know, Lord, why? Why this and why that? And Lord, how long? How long is this going to go on? How long is this going to take? Lord, you promised. You know, these kind of things. Amen? Amen. And I've had them myself. And so tonight's message, I think, is tailor-made for a lot of things that I'd like to say to you. I'm going to preach to you tonight like a, a friend. I want to talk to you like a friend. This is something the Lord gave me a number of years ago. And whenever I read the passage of Scripture, it's going to be a very familiar passage of Scripture, but boy, it's loaded with truth. I want you to take your Bibles, if you will. If you, you go ahead and stand with me if you want to. We'll be turning to the book of Genesis, chapter 29. I want to read verses 16 through 35. This is a passage of Scripture that's familiar to everybody. But oh my goodness, the truths that's in here. The Bible said there was a man by the name of Laban. He had two daughters. It's Genesis 29, 16. He had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said to Laban, I serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, well, okay. It's better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. So he said, just abide with me. And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days. Uh, he loved her and had great love for her. And so Jacob said to Laban, okay, give me my wife now. My days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening, he took Leah, not Rachel, her Leah, uh -huh. his other daughter, the tender-eyed one, mm -hmm. and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. So the Bible says, Laban gave unto his daughter Leah, Zilpha, his maid for a handmaid, and it came to pass in the morning, behold, it was Leah. So in other words, he worked seven years for Rachel, but the Bible said that old Laban called together all the men of the place and was going to make a real festive night of this because he's going to give his daughter to be married to Jacob. And so the Bible says that that night, he pulled a sneaky on Jacob, and he lifted the flap of the tent, and he didn't put Leah through that flap. He put Rachel, or he didn't put Rachel through that flap. He put Leah through that flap. Uh -huh. <laughs> and in the morning, when he woke up, it was, it was. Oh my God! It was Leah. It was not the right woman. And so the Bible said it came to pass in the morning. It was Leah. And he said to Laban, what have you done to me? Didn't I serve you for Rachel? Why have you beguiled me? And Laban said, well, don't that sound just like a, a deceiver? Well, it must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. So he said, fulfill her week and we will give also for the service which you shall serve me seven other years. And Jacob did so. He fulfilled her week and gave him Rachel to wife also. Well, Laban gave Rachel his daughter, Bilhah, his handmaid, to be her maid. And he yes. went in under Rachel. And he loved Rachel more than Leah. Wow. And served him seven other years. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but he closed Rachel's womb. Wow. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. She said, surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction, now therefore my husband will love me. She conceived again and bare a son, and she said, because the Lord has heard, because the Lord has heard that I was hated, he has therefore given me this son also, and she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bare a son, and she said, now this time will my husband be joined unto me. I've borne him three sons. His name 
shall be called Levi. Wow. She conceived again and bare a son, and she said, Now will I praise the Lord, and therefore she called his name Judah, and she quit bearing. So you may be seated. Tonight, I want to talk to you, and I want to use Laban as a type and a shadow. I want to speak about three or four different characters in this story, but I want to talk about Laban as a type and a shadow of God, the Father. I want to talk about Rachel as the type of the ultimate thing that we feel that we're going after for God. It's our highest call. It's what attracts us in the ministry. It's what attracts us to church. Rachel is a type of our ultimate, our place we want to be, our best resourcefulness, our intimate walk with God. Leah is a type and a shadow of everything that we don't want. And Jacob is a type of you and I. Now, the Bible said that Laban had two daughters. The youngest was Rachel. The oldest was tender-eyed Leah. Now, the Bible doesn't really say what was the situation with her eyes. It just said that she was tender-eyed. It didn't say that she was not pretty. It didn't say that she was homely looking. It just said that she was tender-eyed. But it said about Rachel that she was a knockout. Rachel was beautiful, and the Bible said she was also well-favored. She was stunning in form and appearance. And so when Jacob saw how beautiful Rachel was, he just glimpsed at her beauty, and he was smitten. And that's the way it is a lot of times when we're serving God. We see what God has for us. We see a ministry. We see a calling We see something that the Lord has chosen for us, and when we see it, we're smitten with it. Being used by the gifts of the Spirit, being an evangelist, being a pastor, being a teacher, being a worker, having a ministry. And when we see that, it's beautiful. We're smitten with it, and we don't want anything else. Now that we are serving God, we see our destiny, and we're smitten with it. We love what the Lord has for us. And when, he glim- when we glimpse it, when we glimpse it, we're never the same. We can't settle for anything else. We're going after it. We want it. And the Bible says about Leah, it says that she was everything that Jacob didn't want. Everything that he didn't want. When he saw her, He thought she was nice. He thought she was a good woman, but he didn't want her. He wanted the stunning, beautiful, knockout, well-favored Rachel. So here's what I want to say to you. Jacob agreed to work seven more years for Rachel, and yet Laban gave the oldest first instead of the youngest, and Jacob didn't want her. So a lot of times when we come to God, God has his hand on us. He's called us. He's put his hand on us in a mighty way. God has something for us. I remember when I first got into ministry, I was 20 years old, right out of Bible school. I turned 21 the next month. I, got my, I took my first church in June of 1970, and I'd just been out of Bible school just a matter of short few, well, just about a year or so, I guess. And so whenever I got out of Bible school and I took my first church, (laughs) it was in a town of 5,000 people. It was in Georgia. It was in a place called Vidalia, Georgia. You may have heard of it. That's where the Vidalia onions came from. I lived there three years, and I never saw or ate a Vidalia onion the whole time I was there. But I, it was the place of Piggly Wiggly Southern. That's where the Piggly Wiggly headquarters was. And so whenever I moved there, I, I, when, when, when God first called me to preach, I had such grandiose visions for my life. I mean, I saw myself. I literally saw myself pastoring a church 
of about a thousand people. The Lord called me at 14. <laughs> I saw myself pastoring a church of about a thousand people. I saw myself on television. I saw myself in a city that would have a good draw where there'd be a lot of people to draw from. I saw myself successful, and I saw myself with a powerful, romping, stomping Pentecostal choir. Well, that's what I saw. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, if I had just had that, that's what I saw. But I woke up in Vida Day, Georgia. <laughs> it was Leah. It was Leah. It wasn't Ray. It was Leah. And I woke up. I'm in a town of 5,000 people. I'm in a shotgun church. They got a section of pews this way, a section of pews that way. The carpet's tore. The ceiling is hanging down from the ceiling. When it rains, there's mold and mildew. It was Leah. It was everything I did not want. But what God said to me was, if you want what I've got for you, you're going to have to first learn to be resourceful with Leah before you'll be productive with Rachel. You've got to learn to first be resourceful with Leah before you can be productive with Rachel. So I've got something for you. And what God had, I wanted nothing to do with it. So I felt let down, I felt frustrated, I felt hopeless, I felt discouraged, and most of all, I felt delayed. Because what I saw in my spirit when I glimpsed Rachel, I saw that church of a thousand, I saw that Pentecostal choir, I saw myself on television, but now it's like, what? So your Leah could be anything. Your Leah could be whatever it is that you're involved in that you hate and you don't want and you don't want to be any part of it. But yet God somehow in his great wisdom has seen, play, has seen fit to place you where you are. <laughs> Most people feel like they're an eagle sitting on a hummingbird's nest. And Leah could be anything. It means that you feel you're not functioning at full effectiveness and full potential. It means that's the place where you are. I'm not functioning with all I've got to give. Why don't God open a door for me? Why am I in this church I don't want to be in? Why am I pastoring in a city I don't want to pastor in? You feel called to one thing, but yet you're stuck doing another thing. You feel too important to be doing what you're doing. So God allows Rachel to remain on hold and he, remain, he, re, he allows Rachel to remain unproductive until Jacob first learns to accept and embrace Leah. And the Bible said, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now, what does that mean? It means that he now has two wives. He worked seven more years for Rachel. And so what God did was, he saw that Rachel was so beautiful and he wanted her so much and he saw that Leah felt slighted and so God shut Rachel's womb. But now listen, it didn't mean that he shut it and put a lock on it and wouldn't ever let him have it. He just put it on hold for a while. Wow. Wow. And so let me just tell you this. There comes a time in our lives whenever we want to do something so bad and we want it so bad and God's not going to say, I'm never going to let you have it. That's not the way God does. Uh -huh. But by the time God lets you have it, he's going to work so much hell out of you that by the, <laughs> by the time you get it, I said, by the time you get it, you're going to be able to handle it. You see, I wanted that church of a thousand people. I wanted that powerful Pentecostal choir. I wanted that television ministry, but I was a squirt. I was untested, I was unproven, I had a lot of ambition, but I didn't have any wisdom, and I hadn't been yet broken. God said, I'm going to break you, I'm going to send you, and I'm going to let you have it, but first, I'm going to couple you up with Leah. Oh my God, Leah, you've got to be serious, Lord. And the Lord said, I'm dead serious. And so here's what happened. The Bible said he put Rachel on hold for Jacob and he opened Leah's womb for business. 
So closed doors, let me just say this to you quickly. Closed doors don't mean they're closed forever. God is good. And God wants you to prosper. God wants you to be at the best you can possibly be. He wants you to be resourceful. He wants you to be influential. God wants you blessed. And the Lord wants you happy. But God knows there are some things in us that before he can use us, he's going to have to work some things out of us. He's going to have to develop some things in us that we have not yet developed. There's things in you that right now is undeveloped, but it's there. But when God puts you in the right situation under the right people in the right circumstances, that will begin to develop and you will become a different person than you are sitting here right now. Can you shout amen? Amen. So let's talk about the closed door just for a moment. The Lord closed her womb. Beautiful woman walking around, but yet God has him put over here with Leah. And let me say it one more time. Leah represents everything that you don't want about where you're going. You may be called to be a worship leader, but you're playing and strumming the guitar for some other church somewhere. And you just can't stand the idea of just being a musician on a platform when you're called to be a worship leader. And you may feel like that you're called to be a powerful pastor. But yet all you've got is a jail ministry. See, God's got you with Leah right there in that jail ministry. God's got you right there in that nursing home with Leah. And he's developing some stuff in you. Don't run away. Don't walk away. Stay there and man up and embrace it. And God will develop that in you. And one day God's going to use you powerfully the way you want him to use you. But let me just talk about her children here for a few minutes. The Bible says that she had four children. Now, she had more than that, but I'm just going to talk about four of them. I want to talk about Reuben. I want to talk about Simeon. I want to talk about Levi, and I want to talk about Judah. I want to talk about those four children that she had with Jacob. So now, beautiful Rachel's womb has been closed. Now, Leah is going to produce the first child she has. The Bible said she called his name Reuben. Let's look at it together. Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. You know, it's a sad thing when you read this, because Leah knew that she wasn't as beautiful as her sister. She knew that. And Leah also knew that her husband was a very powerful man. His name was going to be changed later to Israel. And they were going to have 12 sons, and they were going to become the 12 tribes of Israel. This is in the early days of a man and his greatness. His name is Jacob, but in the early days of his greatness, God said, I know you see Rachel, but no, I've got you here because I'm developing an Israel in you. You listening to me? I'm developing an Israel in you. I'm developing a nation in you. And the Bible says that she saw her sister, and she knew that her sister was beautiful in the knockout. And I feel for her when I read this story because I know that Leah felt like her husband really did want her sister instead of her. She knew that. And so she had this first child, and look what it says. It says she called his name Reuben because here's what she said when she gave birth. She said, the Lord has looked upon my grief and my affliction. And now that I've given him a child, maybe his heart will fully turn toward me. See what I'm saying? Maybe his heart will really be with me like I need him to be with me. So let's look at this just for a minute. What the name Reuben means, if you look up all these names, they mean something, and that's what I want to preach on tonight. The name Reuben means gifts are given. The name Reuben means gifts are given. It means a gift. It means a son is born. It means gifts are given. While we are busy with our Leah, God is laying the foundation in your life 
of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. I remember when I first got in the ministry and I took that church in Vidalia, Georgia. Man, I was, when I got there, it wasn't what I had in mind. It was a city I didn't want to be in. I was a city boy. This was country. And I didn't, I felt like a misfit. And um, it was in central Georgia. And just not anything going on. I mean, when the sun went down, they rolled the sidewalks up. There was nothing to do. <laughs> there was nowhere to go. There was nothing happening. And so, you know, my wife and I, we, was, we hadn't been married long. And um, we'd go to the, to, the, uh, to the garbage dump at night. And I'd sit on the hood of the car, and we'd pull in the garbage dump, and she'd pull the lights on. And I was sitting up there with a 22 automatic on the hood shooting rats. <laughs> I was good, man. So one night we pulled in there and she said, hey, you get in here and drive. Let me try it. She got up there. She was Annie Oakley, man. I mean, she was popping them rats left and right. And they were just, they were squealing and jumping up and running off. You know, there was nothing to do there. I didn't want to be there. But it was an open door. How many of you know, take an open door. Take an open door. If God's opened a door for you, he's got bigger things in mind for you. It may not be where you want to be, but that's where God's placed you. Amen. But anyway, I took the church. Hallelujah. And whenever I took that church, it was like, oh. I mean, I'm a perfectionist. I don't think y'all probably know me real well, but I'm a perfectionist. The church was a mess. Carpet was torn. The ceiling was sagging. It was a seal tech ceiling. It was stucco inside the church. The roof had leaked so much that the rain had got down behind the stucco and there was mildew inside the church. The parsonage was attached on to the church. Me and Brenda lived in the parsonage. And when it rained, there was stucco back there that was also mildew. But when it rained, there was so much... Um, moisture in the air that I bought Brenda a brand new bedroom suit. I was trying to make her feel good about moving into the ministry. <laughs> and so I bought her a brand new bedroom suit. It wasn't six months. The, the dresser had, had warped up like that. <laughs> I mean, the, the, it was just horrible. So anyway, I went in there and we started to work on the church, fixing it up. I'll tell you more about that in just a few minutes. But boy, you know, I took that church. God bless me. I never had pastored before. I never had really preached much before. You know, I had preached some. I knew I was called to the ministry, but I never had preached much before. And um, I got voted in the church, and they voted me in 99%. How many of you know you're never any good if you get voted in 100%? <laughs> you, you need to get voted in 99 or less to be worth your salt. Amen. They voted me in 99% in the Assembly of God Church. And so I took it. And so everything was going good. And church was growing. Now we had all different kinds of things happening in the church. We had things repaired, looking better. And so... I decided to have my first revival. So I called in an evangelist that I knew. His name was C.W. Mullis. And he was a country boy. And he was a powerful preacher. He was a Holy Ghost preacher. And he was the type that whenever he'd get anointed, his cowlick would start bouncing. <laughs> you know, he'd get to preaching like that and his cowlick get to bouncing. So I'd seen him preach a number of times before. And man, he just always lit me on fire every time I heard him preach. So I called him and I said, hey, would you come to my church and be my first evangelist? He said, yeah, I'll be glad to. Well, we started revival on Sunday night. Cut me down just a little bit. We started revival on Sunday night. And so the place was packed out. I got to go down and leave the platform and I got to go down and sit down by Brenda. Now I'm pastoring. I'm 20 years old, 21 years old, and I'm sitting down there by my wife. The church is slammed full. C.W. Mullis is up preaching. Uh -huh. We in revival. What else? It, things couldn't be better. And so he's up preaching, and his colleagues bouncing. 
So I'm saying to myself, oh my God, all is well in the world. This is wonderful. Thank you, Lord. And about that time, I heard this guy over here on this side of the church say, oh, like that. I thought, okay. All right. So I thought the Holy Ghost was on him. You know, when you're in revival, you think anything's the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I heard it again. Ah! Like, I thought, yeah, he's getting the Holy Ghost on him. Right? <laughs> so uh, he, about that time, he had, it, this was July, and he had blue jeans on. He had a T-shirt on and a leather jacket on in July. Now, how many of you know if you're wearing a leather jacket in July, there's something bad wrong with you in the first place? You know what I'm saying? He had his cigarettes rolled up in his T-shirt, you know. You know what I'm talking about. Had on some leather boots. So we're sitting there in church. And I heard him again, ah! And I thought, oh, well, you know, I sort of leaned up and looked back and see what it was. And he had a demon. And it was, that demon was like a charley horse up under his britcher leg. It was like, you know, it was just running up and down his leg, just tearing his leg. It was demonic. And he was, ah! And I thought, oh, Glory to God, I sure am glad CW's here. <laughs> I sure am glad CW's here. Because CW's going to cast the devil out of him. I know CW. And about that time, I heard CW say, Ladies and gentlemen, he said, It's evident that our brother is tormented by a demon spirit. And he said, Brother Kilpatrick's coming right now to cast him out. <laughs> so, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I sit there, and it's like I had an out-of-body experience. And I'm thinking to myself, what did he just say? I didn't ask nobody what he said. I heard what he said, but I thought, no, no. I mean, I've only been in the ministry two or three months. I'm not even used to preaching. I've never cast a devil out in my life. And I remembered, and I thought to myself, what would pastor say? What would pastor do, brother, my mentor? And I remembered he always said, when all else fails... Just stand. So I stood up. I can't tell you why I stood up, but I stood up. And listen, listen to me. When I stood up, my head, my shoulders went into some kind of a cloud, and I felt a mantle of power come on me. I feel it right now while I'm talking about it. I felt a mantle of power come on me. I started tingling with the power of the Holy Spirit. I left where I was standing, my wife looking at me, like, <laughs> and I walked back there to where he was. I just walked to the end of the pew, didn't raise my voice, didn't scream, didn't yell, and I just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you come out of him right now. Hallelujah. And it quit just like that, and I thought, well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it works. But I tell you what, listen to me, listen to me. What happened? I'm married to Leah. I'm in a place I don't want to be. I'm in a city I don't want to be. I'm in a place that I'm doing a work that I wish I could be somewhere else. But while I'm there, God's teaching me to flow in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Come on, church. I said God's teaching me how to flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The first gift that we had, the first child that we had together was a child named Reuben and God's teaching me how to flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You'll never flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit as long as you can hitchhike on somebody else's faith. I said you'll never flow in the gifts of the Holy Spirit as long as you can hitchhike on somebody else's faith. And that past, that evangelist put me on the spot. It was tailor-made. God sent that man there. And when I was sitting there and I said, what do I do? Pastor's words came in my ear, when all else fails, stand. And when I stood, some kind of a presence, I can't explain it, but some kind of a presence enveloped me. And I went back there under an authority and a mantle that I've never operated under before. And that mantle is still on my life to this day. Can somebody shout amen? Come on, church. I said, come on, church. 
You know what I'm talking about. God's got his hand on you and God's trying to teach you and lead you into the gifts of the Spirit also. And as long as you can depend on mama, as long as you can depend upon daddy, as long as you can depend upon pastor, you're never going to function. But if God ever puts you in a place you don't want to be with people you don't want to be with, God's going to use you in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Woo! Amen? Well, amen. I'm good, brother. Thank you, man. I'm good. Well, the next child that they had, his name was Simeon. What does Simeon mean? Look it up. Simeon means God has heard. It means God has heard. What's God going to do when you get to a place where you don't want to be? A place that you resent. A situation that you're in that you resent. God's going to put you in a place where you have to pray. And nothing is going to work without prayer. He's going to put you in a, a situation where you have to pray. So I took that church. I hadn't been there in no time. I saw that tore carpet. I saw that ceiling. I saw that mold and mildew. And I'm laying in the bed on Monday morning after church on Sunday, and I'm laying there. Brenda's already up. She's always been up all of our marriage praying early in the morning before daylight. She's got her Bible and her shawl and her Kleenex box. She's up praying every morning for 55 years. Wow. Praise God. Every morning praying. So it's our first church. She's already up. Church is attached onto the church. Uh, to the, the parson is attached onto the church. So <laughs> I'm laying in the bed and I'm just thinking. I'm not even praying out loud. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. Laying in the bed wide awake. I hear her and they're humming. I'm just laying there. It's daylight. Right about daylight. And I hear a Knock on the door. And I hear Brenda, just a minute, I'll be right there. And when she goes to the door, I heard this voice say, the man's voice say, preacher here. No, he said, preacher up. I thought, man, I dare you to wake me up this time of the morning. I, I mean, I may be in the country, but I, you ain't going to make no country boy out of me. You know what I'm saying? Preacher up. And uh, she said, he's here? Yeah. He says, he's still in the bed. And she said, I'll get him for you. She said, honey, there's a man here to see you. I got up, put on a pair of sweatpants or something, you know, and just put on a little something, went down the hallway. I was aggravated. Preacher up. None of your business. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is he still sleeping? Ain't none of your business either. <laughs> so I walk down the hallway and I see this guy. He looks like an alcoholic. A little old dried up something or other. Looks like an alcoholic. Looks like a drunkard. Little old bitty guy. And I come walking down the thing and he said, You're the preacher? I said, Yeah. He said, My name is Tom Moxley. I said, my name is John Kilpatrick. He said, you know, see, I was, while I was laying in the bed, I was in there praying. Like I said, I wasn't even speaking out loud, but here's what I was thinking. I was thinking, man, if I just had some metal lath and somebody that could do masonry plaster, I'd tear all that plaster out of the church and we'd put up some fresh metal lath and I'd get somebody to plaster these walls and we'd fix that roof and we'd make this place nice. So I'm laying there thinking that. So he's knocking on the door. I'm walking down the hallway and he said, my name is Tom Moxley. I said, well, what can I do for you? He said, well, he said, you see that Datsun out yonder under that pecan tree? I said, yeah, it's blue Datsun. He said, I got rolls of metal lath out there on the back of that truck. 
And he said, I've come around here to help you replaster your church. And I said, wait a minute. I said, do you go to church here? He said, no, I've never been to church today in my life, son. I said, really? He said, no. I said, well, how did you know that I needed metal lath? I was just back there praying about it. And I needed metal lath, and I needed somebody that was experienced that could put plaster on. And I, I said, how did you know? He said, well, I was at the bar up here on Peachtree Street. <laughs> he said, I was up here on Peachtree Street last Friday night at the bar, and he said, I heard the good Lord say to me, they got a new preacher around here on Georgia in Peachtree Street. And he said, it's that little Assembly of God church around there. He said, you go over there Monday morning. And he said, you've got some of that metal lad left over from a prison job you had. Tell him that you've come to help him. Wow. And I looked out there on the back of that Dotson, and there was that metal lad. I'm just thinking it. I'm not even praying. Yeah. What does God do when you're married to Leah Hallelujah. and you need something? He teaches you how to pray. Hallelujah. You don't even have to speak it out loud. Hallelujah. You just pray. Oh, come on, church. You don't even have to speak it out loud. He said, while it's still in your thoughts, I'll answer your prayer. While the words are still in your mouth, I'll answer your prayer. And come to find out, come to find out, he said, well, he said, you know, he said, uh, I will get in there. And he said, I got some hatchets. And he said, we'll knock all that lath off that church. He said, I've never been in this church before. You have to take and show me. And, and here's the first lesson I learned about pastoring is if God can't speak to people in the pews, he will speak to people on the bar stool. Yeah. I said if he can't speak to the people in the pews, if he can't speak to the board, he's got people sitting on the bar stool he can talk to. <laughs> I walked out on the porch and you can see the morning sun glistening on that metal lab. And I said, Tom, come on, let me get on from Bridges. Come on in this house and let's get, and we tore that stuff out in one day. We put up some fresh metal lab, we fixed that roof. He, he come in there and he took that hawk and trowel. He put in fresh mud all over that metal lab. By the time people came back to church next Sunday, it was up and painted and ready to go. But now listen to this. I made friends with that old boy. Didn't have a tooth in his head. Didn't have a tooth in his head. Little old bitty guy, when he talked, he talked with well, a draw. You know what I'm talking about. Just old country boy. But we made good friends. He loved me, and I loved him. And he started coming to church. And he had a wife. Her name was Carol. And they had a little girl named Nora, and she was a waterhead baby. And they already had a shunt in her head, and she'd already had 16 surgeries at Augusta wow. Hospital. She'd had 16 surgeries on her head because she was a waterhead baby. And they started coming to church. And one Sunday, I called Nora, and I said, Nora, bring, I, I called Carol, I said, Carol, bring Nora up here. You and Tom come up here, that little old church, 40 people, I had 40 people. And I said, come up here. And we prayed for that baby. God completely healed that child. Look, he healed that child. Healed him. Her hair grew out. It was curly. It was curly hair. She grew up just a beautiful little girl. And all took place because I was in a place I didn't want to be. I was living in a parsonage I hated. My dresser had warped. My church was full of mildew. Everything looked like squalor. I'm married to Leah, and we've had our second child now, and the second child is Simeon. God has heard. <laughs> Come on, church. Come on, y'all. Y'all help me now. God has heard. God has Say it with me. God has, God has heard. Let me tell you, God will put you in a place where nothing else will work but prayer. 
You can talk, you can counsel, you can go to, you can ask, you can do all those things, but until you learn to get down and have a conversation with the Lord, let us have a little talk with Jesus and it'll make everything all right. Somebody, un- amen, amen. Somebody shout amen. Well, now here's what happened. She had a third child. Oh, yeah. Well, let's talk about that third child. His name was Levi. You know what Levi means? It means joined to one. Look at it, joined to one. It speaks of unity and coming into intimacy with the Lord. Look what Rachel said. Look what Leah said about having this third child. She said, she conceived again, bear a son. She said, now this time will my husband be joined to him. See, his name means joined. So she named him Reuben because she said, I know my husband still has eyes for my sister. Wow. Wow. I know my husband still has eyes for his sister, for my sister. And so she named him Levi because she said, now maybe he will be joined unto me and be attracted to me. So she named her baby what she wanted in reality. Wow. Now let's look at this for a minute. You know what I found in the ministry, pastoring and being a pastor to pastors? You know what I've found is I have found that God will put us in situations where there's been division and where there's been rancor and there's been separation and disunity. And this works two ways. It works on the one that dished it out and it works on the one that received bad, bad vibes. And I've seen many people that when they get in the ministry, they love the ministry more than they do their family. <clears throat> I've seen people love the ministry gifts and love the ministry and they love preaching and they love that kind of thing and they love the ministry but they are not joined to their wife living in the parsonage. Their heart has now become attached to the ministry rather than their wife or their husband <clears throat> or their children. I've seen pastors, pastor churches, and in the midst of great anointing, get bitter because of the way they've been done and because of the way their family's been done. And I've seen great fallings out. I've seen church splits. You know, if you're around church at all for a while, you're going to see those kind of unpleasant things. It shouldn't be, but that's the way it is. It's it's division. When Jacob was married to Leah, they had this child... And the child's name means joined to one. What she was saying is, I know my husband really has eyes for my sister, but I'm praying that he'll be joined unto me. How many women are married to a man and they know that he just tolerates her? He just puts up with it. He just doesn't really want to have relations with her, picked up a few pounds, doesn't look as good as she did when they first got married. And, um, you know, now all of a sudden, there's gray coming in the hair. She's hurting. Leah's hurting. And she knows, she knows what the facts are. And she says, now maybe, maybe, maybe my husband 
will be joined unto me. You know, if Jesus were to come in that back door tonight and my wife was sitting here on the front row and Jesus walked down this aisle here and he walked right up to Brenda and he took her by the hand and he said, stand up. And I'm up here preaching. <clears throat> and the Lord takes her by the hand and leads her right up to me. And the Lord would look inside of her gut. He wouldn't look at the dress she's got on. He wouldn't look at how nice her hair is. He wouldn't look and see if her purse and her shoes matched. He's looking at her gut inside of her. And what he sees inside of her gut is basically my relationship with him. Because how I have treated my wife is going to be the measure of my relationship with him. Wow. And that's why the Bible says, let a man see to it that he love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And if I have compared her to other women, if I have compared her to other pastor's wives that could play instruments and they could sing and she can't, it makes her hurt. It makes her feel less than. If I have talked about how other women are great mothers and how that they have sacrificed for their families and I say that as if she hasn't done that and she bleeds inside. When Jesus looks inside of her, he sees my relationship with him. Because you cannot exceed a relationship with Christ above what you have with your wife. If the Lord walked up to me and Brenda and she's standing there beside me and the Lord looks at me, he doesn't look at my degree on the wall. He doesn't look at the kind of car I drive. He doesn't look at the size church I pastor. He doesn't look and see what kind of suit I got on or shoes I got on. He looks right in my gut. And what he sees in me is how Brenda has treated me. If she's gone to her father for counsel instead of coming to me, it hurt. And the Lord will see that hurt. If she has gone to her brother or she's gone to other men in the church and asked what do they think and not ask me what I think, he will see that on the inside of me. Are you seeing what I said? And so what God does is he takes us and he puts us with Leah in situations that are broken down. And they're irreparable. It's seemingly irreparable. And it's situations that no man seemingly can fix. It looks like it will be that way till the day everybody dies. They'll be fixated in that unforgiveness and that bitterness until the day they die. Yes. But when you have a child and you name him Levi and it means joined to one, it means that God is up to something and he's trying to repair the broken breach and God's trying to put you back with people that you've been alienated from. Friend, listen, God is in the uniting business. He's not in the business of destroying relationships. Don't burn bridges. Keep that bridge open and God will repair it. Woo! Somebody shout amen. amen. You know, one of the things that God does in churches is he tries to get Pentecostals to be relevant to the Baptists. He tries to get the Baptists to accept the Charismatics and the Pentecostals. He tries to get the peoples that calls themselves United Pentecostals or Oneness, and he tries to get Nazarenes, and he tries to get the, you know, the Episcopalians and the Catholics. He tries to get us all together because we're so fragmented. But what happens when God lets us have a child in a place that we don't want to be in and with people we can't hardly stand? God says, I can repair that breach and I can put you back together. I can put you back together and I can put you back together in such a way that you'll make peace and you'll be glad that you made peace and you'll kiss and hug one another again. That's what that means. I don't know about you, but I hate trouble. I hate confrontation. I hate church splits. I hate, 
people walking away in a tiff. I hate it when people leave, curse the people that stays, and the people that stays curse the people that leave. It's not of God, and God's trying to restore. Come on, somebody, shout the victory. Shout the victory. I feel the Lord in here. Well, she had another child, and this is the last one I'm going to talk about. She had another child, look what it said. She conceived again. That was one fertile mama. And she bare a son, and she said, now will I praise the Lord. And she called his name Judah. What does Judah mean? It means praise. Look here, let me explain this to you real quick. I'm not going to be long on this. I've got to go to close. The name Judah means praise. Yes. Okay, she named him fourth. You know, when people come together in church and they hadn't been operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, gifts are given, Reuben, and they come together and they hadn't been praying, which is God has heard Simeon. And they hadn't forgiven one another, including family members and other church members. And they hadn't made the wrongs right. When they come to church on Sunday, they ain't got nothing to praise God for. Amen. 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 They're full of unforgiveness. They're full of bitterness. They're full of doubt. They're cynical. By the time you get up to preach and by the time the worship team gets up, they've already judged everything that moves. Yes. But I'm going to tell you, if you get together and you find a people that's been praying and a people that's been operating in the gifts of the Holy Ghost, they can't wait for service to start. They can't wait to lift their hands and to lift their voice and begin to praise God. They can't wait to do it. You know why? Because they got something to praise God about. You know, let's just say you're going through Walmart. And you're going through Walmart and you're pushing and and you're just walking through there, you know, like a man of God. I was going through Walmart one time, and this woman was in there, and she's walking the aisle, and she's crying. I could see her face was wet with tears. She's had a little baby in there. She's pushing in the stroller, in the, in the buggy. And I walked over to her. I said, honey, what's wrong? She said, oh. She said, nothing really. I just, my life is just full of pain. has been all of my life. I said, really? She said, yeah, my husband's left us. And she said, this, that, and the other. And she said, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I've come out here today just to try to get out of the house, but I don't know why I'm here because we don't have any money. And I said, well, let's just cure that right now. So I said, go ahead, let's fill this buggy up with everything you need. I'll pay for it. So I was walking with her, and she was putting things in the buggy. And I was just ministering to her. And before I left that day, I led her to the Lord right there in aisle four. <laughs> led, her to the, led her to the Lord. Prayed with her. And got her to repeat the sinner's prayer with me and tears just dripping everywhere. That baby just as quiet. The Holy Ghost just put that baby under some kind of anesthesia. That <laughs> whole baby just as quiet. And I led her to the Lord. Well, you see, by the time I made it to church Sunday, I couldn't wait to get there and tell everybody what happened. You see? You know, how long has it been since we've had church where people couldn't wait to get in off the parking lot? <laughs> they couldn't wait to get in off the parking lot and tell the church what God has done. I led five people to the Lord this week. I prayed four people through the baptism. I cast out two devils this week. Oh, my God, I can't wait to tell the church about it. That's what you call praise. Come on, praise. Some people, listen, you need something to praise God for. Start moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Woo. Start praying. I got up that morning, walked down that aisle. I heard old Tom Moxley's voice. Preacher here. That preacher's still in the bed back there. I was so mad. You see, sometime when God does something, you're mad first and you're glad later. Amen. Amen. 
One of the things I've noticed is truth usually comes in negative form. He said, if you ask me for bread, will I give you a stone? Well, when he gives it to you, it looks just like a stone. And you say, what? But if you hang on to it, it'll turn into bread. Wow. When, when God does something, truth usually comes in negative form. And I heard old Tom Moxley's voice say, well, I just come by here because I heard the good Lord say to me on that bar stool, they got a new preacher around here at the Assembly of God Church. I want you to go around there next Monday morning and tell him you got some metal left. Well, while he's doing that, and driving up in the parking lot, I'm laying in the bed, not even bar- articulating the words. I'm just saying, Lord, if I had some metal lath and some, uh, somebody could do plaster, I'd fix this church. Just like that. Hey, look, listen to me. Listen to me. Where did that happen? It didn't happen with Rachel. It didn't happen with Rachel. You hear me? It happened with Leah. Hallelujah. A place I didn't want to be. I just didn't want to be there. A situation I despise. And I'm laying in the bed, and all of a sudden it's just like it's effortless. Well, why didn't you have to pray about it? And God had him pulling up outside the parking lot with that metal lever on the back of that truck. You see, that's what happens when you're married to Rachel, until you're married to Leah, but desiring Rachel. But let me close. Let me close. God remembered Rachel. And he came into her, and she developed and and bare a child. And oh, what a child it was. God saved the best to last. Hallelujah! God saved the best to last. And what a child it was. It was Joseph. What did God do with Joseph? Raised him up. His daddy put a color on him, coat on him of many colors. He was sold to a caravan going to Egypt. God put him in jail there for a while. Blessed him, raised him up, and let him be second in command in all of Egypt. There was Pharaoh, and then there was Joseph. Listen to me. What did Joseph have whenever he got to Egypt? What, what did they give him? They gave him the keys to the granaries of Egypt. Because yes. he had interpreted the dream of Pharaoh. Uh-huh. And yeah. Pharaoh said, the gods is with this man. And he gave him the keys to the wealth of Egypt. Mm. Wow. You know what I'd like to tell you? Pastor, you were talking about a while ago, 25,000, 50,000, talking about all that stuff. God's got some keys that opens up far greater than that. Yes. Hallelujah. He does. <clears throat> and you've been faithful. Y'all been faithful. This church has been faithful. And you've been faithful. You've prayed. And you've prayed. And you've asked God. You've humbled yourself. You could have backslid and gone back in the world. You could have went back and become a drunkard. You could have went back and had illicit affairs. But no, you just gave it to the Lord. And you just said, Lord, I'm going to wait. I'm not going to betray you. I'm going to hang in here because I believe that joy comes in the morning. (laughs) I believe weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Here's what happened. Let me me hurry. So all said and done now, she had Joseph. She had Benjamin. Now, Listen to this. Now listen to this. Rachel's dead now and so is Leah. Jacob's still living. Now Joseph is head over Egypt. And they went and got his daddy and brought his daddy to him. And his daddy said, I thought I'd never see you alive again. There's all the boys, all 12 of them. Well, Jacob, by now he's old. And it's time for him to die. So they came to him and said, Daddy, you're about to die. 
Who do you want to be buried by? Wow. You want to be buried by Rachel? Or you want to be buried by Leo? And you know what he said? Hallelujah. Bury me by Leo. You know what he come to understand? When God got through with him, he come to understand that Leah had so much integrity. She had so much kindness and patience. And she was such an understanding wife. And he learned more about God by being married to somebody he didn't want to be married to. And he saw her patience and he saw her kindness and he saw her long suffering. And yes, he did have child, child children by Rachel. And she was beautiful. But when the chips were down, here's what he was saying, and I'm going to leave you with this. He was basically saying, your hardest times are really your best times. Wow. Wow. Jesus. Wow. Hallelujah. What he was really saying is, your hardest times best times. What he's saying is when you hurt so bad, when you're so miserable, when you want to run but there's nowhere to run, and when you want to do something but you can't do it, and God just got you in that place, and now your life is over and you look back on it, and what you're actually saying is, oh my God, those times were so good. And what he was saying was, Lord, I learned more about you by being married to tender-eyed Leah than I ever did with my fling with her sister. So let me just say this. If my wife died, and I'm still young enough, hopefully, that if she died, I'd probably get married again. I imagine I would. I don't know. You never know. And if I ever got married again, and they came to me and said, Daddy, where you want to be buried? I'd say, bury me by Brenda. Let me tell you why. I'd go back to every church we ever pastored. I'd sit out in the parking lot, and I'd remember all the pain and all the good times. I'd remember her laugh. I'd remember her prayer. I'd remember her kindness. I'd remember her generosity. And I'd sit there in a parking lot of every church we ever pastored and I would grieve over her memory. Because that's where we fought the battles together and we won. <clears throat> and you know, some of you sitting here listening to me, and here's what you're saying. You're saying, boy, I guess he's right. I guess your hardest times and your roughest times are really memory makers. That's where you learn the Lord. That's where you learn to pray. That's where you learn to move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I can still hear C.W. Smellis saying, and Brother Kilpatrick's coming to cast the devil out right now. You know, there's times I dream about it and I wake up in a cold sweat. <laughs> you know, but here's the thing. I, when I heard him say it, God had it fixed. He had everything fixed to where I remember what Pastor said when I stood up. I stood up in something and it was a mantle that would have never come about any other way except I was forced into it. So maybe you're here tonight and you feel like you're being forced into something, or you feel like there's a power greater than you are that's having some kind of an influence on you, and you don't really like what's happening, but yet you understand now if you hear me preach, I believe this may be the Lord. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to have you stand in just a minute. And I don't want you to stand up. Most churches do like this. They stand up, well, pray, 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 hello, hello. In 15 seconds, it's all over. 
I want you to stand up in just a minute. I want us, when we stand up, to think about every painful thing we've ever been through. I want us to think about all the hell we've gone through. I want us to think about every battle we've faced. I want us to think about every place that God's put us that we didn't want to be there, but yet somehow God worked it out. And now here we are tonight. We're clothed in our right mind, sitting in the house of God, and God's been good to us. I want you to stand to your feet. Come on, let's lift our voice and praise him at least two minutes. Come on, two minutes. Lift your voice.